I'm Kevin Griffin. You know, we we discussed what we would call this class series. It's going to be the next four Tuesdays, all the Tuesdays of April. Sounds like that could be, I don't know, a novel name or a movie. Five hundred days of summer. You know, uh, anybody ever see that movie? Because it, it was about somebody named Summer. So that was the joke, right? It wasn't like Summer had five hundred days. Okay, I just wanted to clear that up for anybody who was really thinking about that right now. Okay. All right, it's hard for me to get started teaching. Uh, I have to meditate first. So that's what we're going to do. But, uh, but we're going to, this, um, this series, I, I wanted to keep it very open that it's Dharma and recovery. But we wanted to make clear that that's not recovery dharma. So uh, it's complicated. Uh, this is just dharma and recovery. And dharma is truth. It's teachings of the Buddha. It's, uh, yeah, the natural law. Recovery is whatever you think it is, although uh, I have my own ideas about that. Uh, yeah, I thought it might be good to give it a little time. Hi, guys. Well, uh, I did bring some books, um, and there's an envelope there, and there's also information on uh, giving something to electronically, but uh, and I usually have a price on them, but I, I'd rather just make it, you know, if you want a book, take a book and give what you feel uh, comfortable with. Um, just make it a Donna exchange then. Um, you see, I, I'll talk a little bit more and that maybe a little, if any other folks are sort of winding their way down 24th Street or looking for a parking place. Um, I, what I've been kind of looking at that I want to talk about, kind of build on tonight will be, uh, the Four Noble Truths, uh, which is the foundation teaching of Buddhism about suffering, the cause of suffering, the end of suffering, and the way to the end of suffering. And, um, so I'm going to go uh, at some point, uh, you know, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll start to talk about that. But essentially how I want the, I'm planning the evening. There's plans and then there's what happens. But this is my plan is that we'll sit for 30 minutes and I'll give some guidance with that. And then I want to do just questions about meditation. Um, and then whatever time is left, I'll go into the Four Noble Truths and and uh, uh, I want to share a little bit of the early uh, teaching, the first teaching the Buddha gave, which is on the Four Noble Truths. It's a very, very rich and subtle uh, teaching uh, that we can kind of get this big picture of these four things. But then as you kind of unravel it, you start to find all these layers in there and different elements uh, that that certainly speak to addiction, uh, as does the whole, really the whole of the Dharma, uh, once we probe into it. So I think that's enough to get us started. So let's let's start with some meditation. And um, you know, just settling into your you know, it looks like everyone here is in a chair, so I'll just say settling into your chair. I, it, it's great if you can sit with both feet on the ground or kind of to create stability. Stability is really a key element of sitting meditation. It's one of the reasons why traditionally people sit on the floor in a, in a lotus posture, because that's a very stable posture. And you can close your eyes or just lower your gaze. Some people aren't comfortable having their eyes closed in a public space. So 
it's fine to meditate with your eyes open or just kind of, you know, having, having your eyes cast down. And even before we start to do anything in our meditation, like start to pay attention to any particular thing, it can be helpful to just notice how you're feeling right now and to notice the contrast between the energy of your day and arriving here to be talking to people. And then all of a sudden you're just sitting still. It can feel almost as if we're continuing to move forward. Well, even on a physical level, but certainly on a mental level. That the busyness of the mind just continues even as we sit down and set an intention to meditate. The one thing about that is that it reminds us that we're not exactly in control here. So one of my dear teachers used to put it, your mind has a mind of its own. And it can certainly feel like that when you turn your attention to your mind and what's showing up. And now, beginning to make some intention, apply some intention, feeling your body, feeling the sensations that are present, feeling how you're holding your body, the balance and alignment. And feeling the breath, feeling the body breathing. Not trying to control the breath or breathe in any special way. It's bringing awareness to the experience of breathing, the sensations at the nostrils, the air coming in and out. Or if it's easier for you to just pay attention to the movement of the chest and belly. There's no right or wrong way to be mindful of the breath. Just whatever feels natural for you. and start to pay attention to the elements of breath, the in-breath and the out-breath, feeling the breath as those two aspects, two distinct aspects.
very different functions. And as we try to pay attention to the breath, it's natural that the mind will wander and get caught up in the habitual thoughts, the stream of thoughts that seems to run continuously. And so when we notice the mind wander, we gently bring it back, bring it back to the breath, to the body, to the present moment. That moment of noticing is a key element of meditation. If we have the idea that we should be in control, then we might be judging ourselves when we realize our mind has wandered. But we want to let go of that misunderstanding. Let go of the idea that we are supposed to control our minds, or that we even can. The Buddha calls this practice training the mind. It's training an unruly mind, a wild and complicated mind, full of twists and turns. But just as with addiction, the fact that we can't control the mind doesn't mean that we can't change our relationship to it. The thoughts may continue, but we don't have to stay attached to them. We don't have to see them as self or as I or as mine. They are simply objects of mind. And as the sitting goes on, Start to apply a bit more of a gentle effort to feel the subtle elements of sensation in the breath. And this will naturally bring more calm and concentration. It's the body and mind 
start to settle into tranquility. Our primary practice is to be mindful of the breath. Notice when the mind wanders and come back. You can bring some insight if you notice how it feels in that moment of wandering mind. So when you realize you've lost the breath and you're caught in thinking before just coming right back to the breathing, check in with how that feels to see the, the disturbance in the body, the agitation, the restlessness. Whatever feeling it might be, anxiety or sadness, anger, boredom, anticipation, excitement. You begin to see the connection between thinking, and the truth of suffering, the grasping and aversion. And once you come back to the breath, settle back, seeing how that agitation passes. Returning to a more stable, calm state.
Oh, that was 20 minutes, not 30. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We're getting enlightened quicker in these days. Mm -hmm. I'm used to teaching, doing 20 minutes online. <laughs> you want to just go back and meditate? Them? We'll be okay. Uh, so as as uh, I mentioned, uh, maybe we could just see if there are any questions about meditation. Love to just talk about that topic uh, with anybody. Yeah. You said something about um, not being in control of our minds, but in our relationship to them in the same way we are with our addiction, but I'm paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. this, would love to hear you talk about that contest. Yeah. Well, I mean, to, to start with, you know, we have this idea in the 12 steps of that we're powerless over our addiction or over alcohol or food, whatever. And, and yet, the, the implication of that isn't that, well, we have to keep drinking, you know. Been, it's that we see that we have to make different choices in relationship to it and that we have to, um, well, as I say, yeah, change our relationship to it, right? I mean, uh, obviously with drugs or alcohol, it's like, it's just abstinence. So with meditation, the first thing we want to see is what our relationship is to our thoughts. And so the, the, the ordinary way of relating to your thoughts is as these are my thoughts and I don't have any choice. This is what's happening and I have to believe them or I have to act on them. You know, if you've never, if you don't have the idea that thoughts are just objects passing through your mind, it's just it's information you're getting right and and that's how the world works basically is that people just run their lives based on their thoughts so when we realize that actually we don't have to do everything our thoughts say and we don't especially have to believe everything that shows up in our mind then that very realization is changing the relationship to the thoughts. And it's seeing thoughts as objects rather than subject, right? The, the, rather than the thought being me, it's just something that's happening within the mind. And I, you know, rather than even saying my mind, but just it's happening. There is awareness and then there are thoughts. That in itself is somewhat of a revolutionary concept. Yeah. And it's really the beginning of the whole path of freedom that Buddhism points to. Because it, 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 implicit in that is that self is a construction. Because the, the awareness that's looking at the thought is no more mine than the, the thoughts themselves because you know how do i have control of my awareness you know not any more than i have control over my mind or by the thoughts so that's the essential change in relationship is moving from subject to object and and then the choices that come out of that 
So that means we start to apply, uh, we start to observe these objects and make choices. Oh, is, does this seem like a helpful thought? Does this like, is this, is this a true thought or do I see the kind of uh, toxic nature of it? or the trauma informed nature of it, you know, and, oh, I, that's, oh, I recognize, I know that story. And then we start to see thoughts, right? We start to, oh, that one, that, that's about mom and, uh, and, uh, and the, you know, oh, okay, I'll just breathe. And, and then I can spend the rest of the evening on this. So I appreciate the question because the, there's another layer to this, which is not just thoughts as objects, but th but the feelings, the, the underlying feelings that arise in relationship to it. So we're starting to see this conditionality. Came up with this term a couple of weeks ago. I was talking to my daughter about the four foundations of mindfulness, as one does with one's daughter. <laughs> and about the way so the four foundations of mindfulness are body feelings mind and phenomena which is really like dharma but we'll put that aside the first three they're all conditioning each other the body conditions feelings feelings condition the body thoughts condition feelings thoughts condition the body, the body conditions thoughts, you know, the breath can conditions the body, the breath, you know, it, and so this term came up for me, interconditionality. So that's the way all this stuff is going on in, in our experience. And, and so it's the old thing of like, you know, you pull on one thread and the whole thing starts to come apart. So you can come into this exploration from any one of these doorways through the doorway of body through the doorway of feeling through the doorway of mind through the doorway of phenomena and you will start to see all these interrelationships interconnections and this is then taking this whole idea of changing the relationship even further because you're starting to see that it's not just subject and object it's that that the the objects themselves are all intertwined and intertwined with the subject as well. So it just becomes like, I mean, you can, you know, make yourself nuts trying to figure it all out. But the point is, we just stop because what our practice is so much about just stop. What's going on right now? What am I believing? What am I attached to? What is causing suffering right now? And starting to unravel that through this process. So now probably you've forgotten what the original answer was, not to mention the original question. So I'll stop. Maybe something will be remembered. Tom, Joe, uh, Tom, Joe, Mike, Mike, Mance, yeah. It's okay. People don't, have, you don't have to ask questions. I brought my uh, Kindle because the book that I would be reading from is about this thick. It was easier to bring this. So, um, as I said, I wanted to start and, and maybe even make these four weeks kind of built around uh, the four foundations of mindfulness. Is that what I said? No, the four noble truths. You got to get to your lists. Okay. And I say, I, I, I'm not making a promise. I don't generally plan much about my teaching. Uh, I just, it's, I don't know. I don't like to do it. But so 
So I thought we could, uh, first of all, kind of get into the a little bit of the technicality of this teaching and then, you know, bring out some of the things that are particularly relevant for people in recovery. Um, so, I mean, and just, so the last several years and my last book are, have all been around, in my teaching has been a lot around these early Buddhist teachings called suttas from the Pali canon, this collection of teachings that, you know, vast collection. And they're, you know, they originate 25, 2,600 years ago as an oral tradition and then they eventually get written down. But they're not really organized in a way that a modern reader or editor or writer would, would organize teachings. So this is the, supposed to be the very first teaching that the Buddha gave. And it's like 1,200 pages into this book. You know, like, what? I remember, like, it took me a long time to even find it. Like, I knew about it, but I and I had this book, and I was like, where's that one? And it's like right in the middle of all this stuff. It's called Setting in Motion the Wheel of the Dharma. And in Pali, that is Dhamma Chaka Pavatana, which I had to practice quite a few times to get down. It's kind of like, you know, Victor Wembayana, you know. You, you got to practice these names. <laughs> Dhamma Chakra Pavatana. And, and Pali is this really poetic language. You, when you hear it like that, that's, a, that's like a poem right there, right? Dhamma Chakra Pavatana. Just like it. Once you learn it, it rolls off the tongue. It's funny. At first, I would hear it like, what are they saying? And then once you oh, yeah, that's. And, and, there, and it's like one word. <laughs> it's like German. You know, they just put all the words together into one word. And you start to learn to okay, Dhamma Chaka. All right. So this is supposedly the Buddha has his enlightenment experience. And then he's like, who am I going to teach this to? This is way too deep. Most people are going to just, you know, they're going to like argue with me. It's going to, I'm not even going to bother, bother. But in the mythology of Buddhism, this Brahma God comes out of the Brahma heavens and says, no, no, you have to teach. No, we've been waiting up there in all the Brahma worlds for you to, to become enlightened and to teach. And, and famously, there's a line, he says, or I don't know, the Brahma, Brahmas are, even have gender, but the, the Brahma God says, there are some with just a little dust in their eyes. Another very poetic line, you know, who will get it. And so the Buddha's like, well, who will, who do I know who might be able to get this? So he thinks, well, my, there, are, uh, there are my two teachers. And then with his divine eye, now he's like got this, uh, not, it's not omniscience, but it's pretty close apparently. He realized, oh, they died since since the last time I saw them. So then he remembers there were the five ascetics that he had been practicing with. The ones who thought that he was lame because he decided to eat. <laughs> and they're like, oh, he's, he's gone soft on us. But he goes back to them and, and, he, and he finds them in the deer park, park at Isipatana. At, at Varanasi in the Deer Park at Isipatana, and you can they, you can go on tours now in India, like where you where you go to these different places. There's nothing there, of course, a couple of rocks. <laughs> I mean, Buddhism was wiped out in India, 1197. It's not really been there since then. Um, but he finds these five ascetics, and and when they see him coming, they say, oh, oh here comes Gautama, like, uh, you know, don't, like, don't pay attention to him. You know, like, like they, they want to be really cool because, like, they had kind of ostracized him. Mm -hmm. But, like, his energy is just, they, when they, he's like, oh, my God, like, oh, okay. And, and they say, uh, they fix it, so they fix a seat for him, and then they they say to him, oh, you know, greetings, friend. And he's like, no, no, not friend anymore. <laughs> now I am 
and he gives him that what he's going to go by to target her. His new the title he gives himself. It's kind of like when Napoleon crowned himself. Yeah, you know, the Pope had the crown, right? And Napoleon goes, "Give me that thing. I'm emperor." You know? That guy was a badass, but he made some serious mistakes. Invading Russia is just never a good idea. It just never works. But the Buddha obviously was much wiser than Napoleon. I don't mean to be comparing the two. I just, I'm easily distracted. So he starts out, oh, wow, my Kindle, you know, you can't trust these objects. Uh, electronic objects. Here we go. Almost. <laughs> Just about. <laughs> Come on. All right. Um, no, I've completely lost. All right. I will find it again. Settings. There we go. And stay here. <laughs> All right. So, so he comes in, and this is the the first thing he. Talks about we know we know that in the sutta he's going to introduce the four noble truths, which is the foundation teaching of Buddhism. But that's not the first thing he teaches them, but not the first thing he says. He says he calls them bhikkhus, which is a name for, for monks. Bhikkhus, these two extremes should not be followed by one who has gone forth into homelessness. <laughs> homelessness was like a good thing in those days. Just another, you know, things change. <laughs> what to? What two are the what are the two extremes you should not follow? The pursuit of sensual happiness in sensual pleasures, which is low, vulgar, the way of worldlings, ignoble, unbeneficial, and the pursuit of self-mortification, which is painful, ignoble, unbeneficial. Without veering toward either of these extremes, the Tathagata has awakened to the middle way, which gives rise to vision, which gives rise to knowledge, which leads to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to nibbana. So, you know, the language here is obviously, you know, very formal and and dry and, you know, comes out of, as I say, an, an oral tradition. So, but the point is this middle way saying indulging in, in sense pleasures just trying to feel good all the time that doesn't work so that's like pretty clear to people who have had addiction problems right we tried that which is one of the reasons why i think people in recovery really get buddhism on a on a very deep level because it's such a a key idea and and to really take it in, you kind of have to have been there. Theoretically, you know, you can hear it theoretically and go, yeah, yeah, but I mean, come on. And, uh, but then the other side of it, which is, and, and so this is what he'd been doing, living this ascetic life where he was starving himself to death and doing these, you know, practices that are just horrifying, you know. That, which is another form of spiritual, it's a form of spiritual practice that's practiced to this day uh, in, in certain traditions. And, you know, we see it in the medieval Catholicism and certainly in Hinduism. And, uh, you know, that's not, uh, you know, the, the, the closest thing to that in the addiction world, it would be anorexia or bulimia, right? Uh, but most of us, that isn't so much the problem. So it's interesting to reflect on how the self-mortification side of it, what that can mean for us. And I think the best way to think of it is to think of it on the mental level. When we attack ourselves internally, sometimes called the inner critic or the inner tyrant, when you watch your own mind, you know, notice how often you're putting yourself down or even you're meditating. It's like, oh, what's wrong with my, my mind wandered? You know, geez, I'm not meditating very well. You know, just the, all the negative self-talk. Well, that, that's what the Buddha is talking about. That's not helpful. It's not useful. Right? And sometimes it can feel like either we deserve it or maybe like 
you know, if I'm not, if I'm not tough on myself, I'm going to, you know, be irresponsible or I'm going to, you know, and, and there can be a little bit of this in the, in the recovery world, you know, well, you need to write more inventory, you know, uh, you got to do more service, you know, kind of like you're not doing enough. It's like, oh, you know, maybe, um, I mean, I, it's really one of the reasons that I, I stopped working with my sponsor. <laughs> I mean, that's 20 years ago, so, you know. Because, um, you know, it felt like there was somebody watching over my shoulder all the time. I kind of like didn't trust me. And, and and right we and we do that to ourselves right we don't trust ourselves i mean especially if you've been an addict it's not unreasonable to consider you that you might not be trustworthy you know and and i think that's part of re recovery an important part of recovery is to build trust in ourselves and we have to build trust in others very often as well those we've you know betrayed ripped off uh you know disappointed you know uh, but that, but that sense of it's okay. I can, I can do this. You know, uh, I, I'm okay. You know, I'm not a bad person. So this middle way is really, really important, uh, and, and it can really be, a, it can be applied in so many ways. Uh, I mean, one of the ways that I, I think that I notice is the sense of. Am I doing enough? I should be working harder, you know, and whatever that means for you in your life. Like I should, I should uh, do more service or I should, for me, it's like, um, I should really spend more time writing, you know, or I should, I, I really ought to meditate more than just an hour a day. You know, I should be meditating two hours a day, you know, and, and, and you know, I, I, I really let myself have a lot of comfortable time. Like, uh, I mean, I'm 74 years old, still working. <laughs> I play golf. Don't judge me. <laughs> and usually when I meet people on the golf course, they, one of the first things they say is, are you retired? Because <laughs> they look at me and they think, old man, Retired, right? And then I think, should I be playing golf? Oh, maybe I should be like doing more teaching. You know, I could be doing, why am I not teaching five, you know, Gil Bronsdale during the pandemic, seven days a week on YouTube, right? I don't know if any of you were watching. I was like, really? <laughs> like, I was like two days a week. That's good. Give me a break. But we, I mean, we all have to find out what's a middle way for us, right? I know, I know Gil. He's a wonderful person, and he is not a workaholic. I, I'm sure that for him was the middle way. That was like comfortable, and it was only I think he was only doing like 20 minutes every morning. Like it was before I got up. It was like you know, eight o'clock or something. But you know. Yeah, we have to, and nobody can tell you what the middle way is, right? It's like you're on the tightrope. Somebody's going to tell you which way you should lean. <laughs> nobody can tell you that. Only your body can tell you. So finding our middle way is so important in our lives and recovery, you know? So for some people, the middle way is 10 meetings a week. Like, for other people, it's like, oh, once a week, it's good. Other people like, you know, I, I used to go to meetings. I don't go to meetings. So I'm okay. Uh, it's not up to us to judge anyone else. We don't know what they need, you know. And, and believe me, you know, in AA, especially, people all know what you need. So, you know, go to a meeting and share and you'll find out what you need. It's, I mean, I, I had an experience, you know, probably a decade ago now, but, you know, we hold on to things <laughs> in the parking lot after the meeting in Berkeley, you know, the Walnut Square noon meeting. Someone saying to someone, a regular there, because I knew it, because every time I was there, he was there, 
saying to me, I don't see you very here very often. <laughs> to which my response was, yeah, I don't come that often. And, and he said, well, you must go to other meetings. I said, well, not, not really. And guess what the next thing he said was, you need to go to more meetings. <laughs> and I thought, well, my first thought was, fuck you, don't tell me what to do. I'm not, I'm not coming back here. And then my second thought was, oh, that's how people relapse, by getting pissed off because somebody tells them what to do so they don't come back to the meeting. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'd been around long enough to be able to see that. But I just really thought, like, you know, that's not helpful. That's how, that's how you alienate people, by telling them what they need before you even talk to them. Maybe have a conversation with me and find out who I am before you decide what I need. Maybe even then, you don't know. I mean, I don't know what I need, you know? I mean, how do you know? I, mean, I, I have some idea. But the middle way. So uh, uh, what I want to then turn to is that the, the middle way is also what we're looking for in meditation. Looking for isn't quite the right word, but We'll use it as starting point. Because this is the, the challenge in meditation is how to make effort. This is like the number one challenge of meditation. You know, we get this instruction and then we can't, it doesn't happen like that. Well, you know, pay attention to your breath. Okay. Um, my mind's wandering. Okay. How, how hard should I try to do that? You know, th there's more instructions I can use. I could count my breaths, could really get on it. You know, I could use one of those gatas, the Thich Nhat Hanh thing, or, you know, the Anapanasati Sutta, <laughs> the 16 steps of the Anapanasati. That would be good. I'll just do that. Uh, you know, and, and, or you can just go like, put a mask on and just like meditate. Like, you know, it was interesting during the pandemic of like, you know, going to a class and meditate. This is different. <laughs> but uh, it's kind of like, I'm going to force myself to just be with my breath. <laughs> that doesn't seem like that's exactly what the Buddha meant by right effort. You know, okay, well, I'm just going to kick back. Like, I'm just going to, you know, why am I like sitting like this? Why don't I just relax? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I can meditate. Mm -hmm. What? Oh, what? You're meditating? Oh, yeah, right, right, right. Okay, that, that might be not enough effort. That was me demonstrating not enough effort in case you weren't sure what was going on. I, I, I mean, I don't have any acting, you know, experience, so I do my best. Maybe a professional could help me out. So, again, we get into this conundrum. Well, <laughs> there's this word supposed to that shows up for me. It's like, what am I supposed to do? What's my, and then not just the question of what am I supposed to do, but what's it supposed to feel like? Like, <laughs> you know, you're meditating, you're like, Am I being mindful? <laughs> I feel my breath. I guess that's mindful. I mean, people ask me that. I'm like, is that? And then it's like, wait, I know I was just thinking for a while. I wonder how long that was. Maybe I should like set a time. Okay. This whole thing, like, I've set up this idea in my head about that if I'm meditating, I'm either doing it right or I'm doing it wrong. I'm winning or I'm losing. I'm passing or I'm failing. And when you start to see that, you realize that doesn't seem like right effort or right mindfulness either. I don't think that's what the Buddha would was really talking about. 
because I'm fighting with myself and I'm judging myself. And even when it's going well, I'm praising myself. <laughs> and it's like, I, this isn't like a competition. <laughs> In fact, I think I'm supposed to be really in some other kind of economy altogether, you know, that isn't about accumulation or doing it right or control. And it, and it really, it throws us immediately when we really address this, when we really look at what the practice is, it throws us into this really disorienting place because it's not how our society views any activity. You know, when I'm playing golf, if I hit a bad shot, I am not happy. I'm not like, ah, <laughs> just breathe in and come back to the golf ball. I'm like, ah. You know, if, if you get fired from your job or, you know, your lover breaks up with you, you know, it's, it hurts, painful. And what you want to do is figure out how to get it right. And, and meditation just doesn't like work in that kind of system. And so we have to learn this other way of being, of understanding our experience and understanding this process and I'll come back to the, the tightrope because it's very similar to that in a way that there isn't, when you're walking a tightrope, which I've never done, but I've seen people doing it, you are never walking straight. You're never in the middle. The middle way is not a straight line. You know, right effort is not a straight line. Right mindfulness is not a straight line. It's always correcting. It's this process of correcting, of bringing it back to the, oh, it slipped over up to bring it back, bring it, coming back, coming back. You know, and so what I find helpful and interesting, another parallel with recovery is what's the last thing they say at every AA meeting? Keep coming back. What's the instruction that they give you in meditation? Keep coming back. So what we start to see is that it's not about the results. It's about the showing up. It's about the continuity. If you meet somebody who, was in recovery that you don't ask them, well, you know, if you had any bad days in your, rec in your recovery, you know, are, are you doing it right? Uh, like, you know, uh, you, you say like, how long have you been sober? <laughs> if, if somebody goes on a meditation retreat and they come back, you don't say, Geez, did your mind wander at all when you were there? Did you have any sleepiness? Or you say, how long was the retreat? Because we know that what's really important in both processes is the sustained effort. And which does not mean in, in the recovery world that it has to be, you know, that we don't relapse. That's part of the process. It's the coming back that's important in meditation. It's not that the mind doesn't wander. It's the coming back that's important. And that's where we find that's the middle way. And, and, and then in meditation, what's key about that coming back is what is the energy that you come back with? What, what, and are you coming back like this? Get back here, you little. Or are you coming back like, here, come on. It's okay. Start again. You're okay. Right? Completely different. You arrive at the same place. You're still just back at the breath. But are you doing it with love or are you doing with, you know, anger, with judgment? So that to me in meditation 
it's more important for me to watch that energy than it is even to watch my breath. I just want to like notice what's my attitude? What am I feeling right now? When, when I tune into how I'm feeling, and what I mean by that is like, does it feel like I'm cons constricted or does it feel like I'm open? You know, does it feel like I'm relaxed and present or does it feel like I'm anxious? You know, that, that tells me whether I'm being mindful or not. You know, when, when I'm not mindful, it means that I'm caught up in greed, hatred, and delusion. So desire, aversion, spacing out. And if I attune to how that feels, how I feel, I'll know if it's an unpleasant, constricted feeling that I'm in one of those unwholesome states. And, but if it feels okay and kind of grounded, then, oh, it's a wholesome state. So I must be present. You know? And that's enough to be mindful. I don't have to necessarily pay attention to the breath. The breath is a very convenient meditation object. But for me, the, the real core object is the felt experience that, that acts as a mindfulness bell that, or even a non-mindfulness bell. You know, like, oh, ooh, I'm really getting tight. here away you know and uh, and again in in meditation we tune in it's the the, the attunement there that tells us if we're in the middle way there isn't you know something more graphic or more substantial that we can uh, re rely on to give to let us know if we're practicing the middle way, it's just a, you can feel it just like you could feel, you know, oh yeah, I'm tipping too far. No, no, you know, yeah, it, again, like on the tightrope, you can't just go like, okay, two degrees to the right, three degrees to the left. No, you're, it's all a felt experience. It's very subtle and you're attuned to it. Well, that's the very first thing that the Buddha talks about before he introduces the Four Noble Truths. And then, then he introduces the Eightfold Path, which is interesting because just, you know, the, the, this is important. So uh, it's lists. Four Noble Truths, suffering, the cause of suffering, the end of suffering, the way to the end of suffering. That's four. That fourth one is the Eightfold Path. So it's not strange. It's because, like, let's get right down to it. Right? Yeah. I'm not going to go through the eightfold path right now because I want to uh, uh, talk. To start with just the, like I said, saying start is maybe not the right word. Uh, but right now, talk about the first noble truth, and, uh, and this is a really incredible teaching. The, the deeper I've gotten into it, there's a turn it takes that uh, I think is quite fascinating. So here he is introducing the first noble truth. Now this bhikkhus is the noble truth of suffering. He doesn't name them as one, two, three, four. We, we've done that. This bhikkhus is the noble truth of suffering. Birth is suffering. Aging is suffering. Illness is suffering. Death is suffering. Union with what is displeasing is suffering. Separation from what is pleasing is suffering. Not to get what one wants is suffering. In brief, the five aggregates subject to clinging are suffering. So that last line is like a whole other Dharma talk. So, but we may... I, I might open it up a little bit later but if we have time. But he's just kind of he's kind of bursting our bubble about life, you know. 
and, and it's, you know, it's a, I mean, it's not, you know, it's not that the Buddha just teaches about suffering. He teaches, but he starts out by being really graphically honest about the difficulties of life. And it's very unlike other religions, it seems to me, that tend to lead with paradise, you know, lead with heaven, lead with the good news, right, the gospel, you know, rather than leading with, you know, there's all this crap that we have to deal with. But for, when we look at this in relation to recovery, we can see, oh, there's this parallel, again, with recovery, which is in order to get into recovery, you have to first face the darkest, deepest, darkest secrets, the deepest, darkest behaviors. You know, you have to be completely honest about it. It's we live in a, a delusion when we are addicts. We, we're kidding ourselves and we're trying to kid the rest of the world. We're trying to, you know, hide from the truth and uh, and kind of get around it. Well, I can, you know, it's not that bad. It's like I can, I'm controlling it, you know, all that stuff. And and it's only when we just face it like head on that we have the opportunity to change. So it's like just the principle that before you can find a solution for something, you have to see what the problem is really clearly. And that's what the Buddha is starting with here. It's not saying that everything about life is horrifying and miserable. It's just like, there's a lot of difficulties in life. And if you really want to be free, if you really want to be happy, the first thing you have to do is see these things. And then with the second noble truth, see what causes them. And then the third noble truth, see the potential for transformation. And the fourth noble truth, take on this job, this task, this path of, of engaging with it and finding a way through it so that it's not suffering. Uh, but a couple things here. I mean, I mean, first of all, I think it, it's, you know, he, he's going through like life, birth is suffering, right? Aging is suffering. I mean, even, even that first statement, birth is suffering is a very, uh, again, sort of an uncommon thing to say, because we think of, you know, oh, a, a new child coming into the world and the love that's involved there and the, you know, the joy of a family and, you know, but if you've ever been at a birth, it's really painful. It's really difficult. It's really dangerous. And lots of people die, uh, both mothers and, and children in that process. So it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that is that is a problem. You know, I mean, I, I don't know what I don't remember the you know, squeezing out, but it can't be comfortable. I don't know. But, Aging is suffering. I can speak to that. Uh, illness is suffering. Death is suffering. But, you know, getting right down to it, you know, not to get what one wants is suffering. You know, just like, oh, yeah, right, you're right. And, and so but what the Buddha teaches about how to engage with this, it's not at all meant to be indulging in it or... or you know, getting swept away with it. But he says, you need to understand it. For each of the noble, four noble truths, there's a verb that goes along. You should understand suffering, which is what Thich Nhat Hanh really emphasized when he talked about uh, compassion. You know, and because compassion is then the natural thing that comes out of understanding suffering. It's it, it, the Buddha never talks about it in this teaching, but again, it's something that we can e easily see as implied. So the uh, this last sentence, in brief, the five aggregates subject to clinging or suffering. The next teaching that the Buddha gives is the teaching on not self, and it's about the five aggregates. So the five aggregates are the five aspects of our experience or of our existence. Yeah, five aspects of our existence that create the illusion of a solid single self. 
uh, the five aggregates are body, <laughs> feelings. You notice that I was talking about uh, the four foundations of mindfulness there related. Body, feelings, perceptions, mental formations, and consciousness. And in that second sutta, the Buddha addresses these and points out that all of these things are impermanent. None of them are solid or stable. Our body, our feelings, our perceptions, our consciousness, our volitional formations, none of them are stable. And then he asked the monks, is something that's impermanent and unstable, can we call that a self? And they're like, no, not really, I guess not. Because like, what is it that we're calling a self? It's that, it's that thought. It's my body. Oh no, it's changing. There's nothing like, oh, I, right when you name it, it changes. Right? I mean, if we could see our bodies or our minds in unlike a microscopic level, we'll see that there's nothing stable. Right? It's constantly changing, vibrating on an atomic level and a nuclear level. And the, the reason that they cause suffering is because we either think or want them to not change. I don't want my body to get older, you know? I want to be able to stop my mind. Uh, I, can't, I can't like even hold on to, you know, a thought. Uh, so I write them down, you know, and I'll go back and read them later. I'm like, oh, I thought that? That's interesting. Yeah, that's weird, right? To write something and then go, I mean, I'm sure many of you have done things like this eventually. I know there are some writers here. You, you know, maybe you've put something aside for a few years and you go back and you read, what was I thinking? <laughs> the hell, that's stupid. <laughs> that was me? No, that wasn't me. That was him back then uh, and this is me here now well which one is what no, no, this is not, there's no you can't so uh, that's what that opens up this whole other so it's interesting it's like the, the buddha kind of giving a preview to the next talk <laughs> and next week on on buddhism in, in ancient india we'll be seeing the buddha goes not so So, truths and, uh, so this is the noble truth of the origin of suffering. We usually say the cause of suffering. It is this craving which re re leads to renewed existence accompanied by delight and lust, seeking delight here and there. That is craving for sensual pleasures, craving for existence, craving for extermination. So we mostly point to the craving for sensual pleasure here as the prime cause. And cer certainly here, again, we have this direct correlation with addiction. Oh, you know, what's the pain of, of addiction? It's the craving. It's the sense that I need something. And then my attempt to hold on to it, to not let it go. It, it's really not the substance you know, alcohol and drugs weren't my problem. It was my relationship to them. It was my craving. It was my need for them. And the craving for existence is about ego. Craving for extermination is really trying to get away from it all. You know, just wanting wanting it all to uh, wanting to, wanting to turn it off. Now I'm just going to go to sleep, which we do. Now, this speaks is the noble truth of the cessation of suffering, the remainderless fading away and cessation of that same craving, the giving up and relinquishing of it, freedom from it. So the third truth is, is just letting go. And this speaks is the fourth is the noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering. That is right view right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. 
So that the that's the eightfold path, and you know the eightfold path is really the work. That's where we you know that's the place where we really find the work and and where we're given the guidance of this of this practice and this teaching. You know, and I, I love looking at this, even looking at this sutta this morning and looking at it again now. Something that, you know, I've been practicing since 1980 and heard my first talk and read my first teaching on the Four Noble Truths at that time. And I've never lost interest in it. And, and even further, I, it's something that keeps uh, getting deeper. You know, the, the sense of it, the layers of it, and what it really means. And what, you know, the challenge that it puts forth, right? It's just uh, one, of, one of my daily uh, practices is to, at the end of my morning sitting, to just say, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. And uh, this past fall, I was uh, on a retreat and I was reading uh, from a book uh, by Ajahn Amaro and Ajahn Pasano called The Island. And it's, and it's an exploration of the, of enlightenment, of how, uh, what the Buddha says about enlightenment and how that's attained. And one of the things that Ajahn Pasano talked about was that taking refuge is one of the key aspects of that, of uh, just developing or uh, uh, breaking through to that experience of enlightenment. And I thought, you know, I say that every day, but um, I think what he's saying is, I mean, clearly what he's saying is it, it means a lot more than just repeating uh, ritualistically some words or even thinking about them. Taking refuge in the Buddha. There is no Buddha anymore. <laughs> He's long gone. So there's various ways to understand that, but one of the most helpful ways to understand it is to see the Buddha as representing the, the enlightenment principle or the principle of of awakening. And when I take refuge in that, saying that my intention is to be awake all the time. When I take refuge in the Dharma, and my intention is to see everything I experience through the lens of Dharma, not through the lens of Kevin. And then the refuge in the Sangha, Primarily, it's the community, making the community uh, the central uh, relationship in my life. And as I reflected on that, I saw more clearly my own shortcoming around that. My, um, that the commitment to being awake all the time, I mean, I think that very few people do it, are able to do it. And, and uh, you know, I spent, uh, I visit with the monastic community at Abayagiri, which is up in uh, near Ukiah, and it's in uh, uh, a monastery in the, in the Thai forest tradition. And I've read 
a lot of, of about that tradition and some of my main teachers have been monks in that tradition. And what becomes apparent is that the whole structure of their lives is based around helping them and supporting them in being awake all the time, in being mindful all the time. And from reading the things that these various monks say about their lives and their experience as monks, it's clear that they're failing at that <laughs> in the same way. We all fail at that, right? And that maybe, as I say, there maybe there are some fully enlightened masters who have gotten to this level where they're just awake all the time. And and you know, and and I would and they would say that there are. Uh, I'm and I'll take them at their at their word. I, I don't think they're making that up. But for most of us, um this this possibility of being awake all the time seems unattainable. Uh, which is why when I started this little piece of this talk, uh, which is why this practice continues to be uh, challenging and and inspiring because uh, much like golf <laughs> you can't perfect it you know uh, maybe you can again yeah maybe you can perfect it but uh, it it it's got so many so many layers you know the the potentials there is so uh so rich you know Je i mean you know, you know, I, I even with all my experience and practice, I still feel like a beginner, and I, I don't know. You know, it it, it often feels like oh, <laughs> like um, no, I don't know. I don't know how to finish that sentence, but. Uh, it, so it it's it's never uh, boring, you know. It's never boring. So it just has this potential that even as a simple an idea as I take refuge in the Buddha that I've been hearing for decades, like it was just last fall that I had this insight about it, right? And I'm like, oh wait, oh that means more than I thought. So. Oh, uh, well, we're running out of time. So, maybe any uh, any thoughts from anyone before we? You know, uh, uh, oh yes, thank you, thank you for your talk. Kevin, What's your name? I'm Nelly. Nelly, hi. Hi, Kevin. Good to see you again. Thanks. Um, you you mentioned the word enlightenment a uh, few times, and and the, the the Buddha is awake, and then you came back to awakening. Yeah. Something about enlightenment is something that I want. This is what's confusing for me. Yeah. It's like that in the same way as the steps are, and sobriety is someday mm. I will. It's wanting. Yeah. It's wanting. Therefore, enlightenment is a want. But and, uh, and the Buddha didn't call himself or did might he called himself the way. He woke up. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's a dire question. Fair. Uh, and and Uh, you know, uh, when we get into the language of it, you know, gets debated, you know, um, I mean, because the term enlightenment really comes out of a Western philosophical, like, 18th century, you know, romanticism or, you know. Well, then, if I may go Please. on, you, the expression of happiness, you know, you mentioned the word happiness, and we will receive happiness. I'm not, you know, and, 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 and the idea also of, of like, like it's all about wanting. It comes to, to the struggle of suffering. It's, right. You know, there is anguish. There is stress. Mm -hmm. There is suffering. Uh, yes, absolutely. 
But then, it, but sometimes I heard him talk, and I hear in sobriety a lot. It's somewhere other, mm. and this is this is what I question. It's not other. Yeah, and I love that you put it back at the very end there. It's here. Yeah, that this is where it happens. Yeah. Not so, you know, not back there when I was suffering and tormenting about my golf game. But right here at this very moment. So I, yeah. again, you're right. It's language, isn't it? No, I, I mean it's a, it's it's an important point, and and I think it's one that um, it's easy to as I started started to talk kind of talk about turning our practice into this uh, competition and a striving, and that 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 is just replicating. The ordinary consciousness in, in 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 this oh now i'm a spiritual person but i'm just doing the same thing and absolutely i mean I, and and at the same time there is such a thing as effort you know we have to show up and so I, one critical for me helpful distinction is that there is the word tanha which is the cause of suffering the thirst craving. And then there was a word chanda, which is the wish for spiritual awakening or the wish for growth. So that there, there is this desire. It's a form of desire, but it's a wholesome form of desire. It's an energizing and inspiring form of desire, like, you know, a positive ambition, you know, something to that. So there, there still is this understanding that there is this potential but uh, uh, as you're pointing out, if we set ourselves up, make this a dualistic, you know, turn it into a thing, uh, uh, I'm here and that there, then that's just another cause of suffering. So how do, how do we, I mean, this is again, the challenge of the middle way is how do I make effort? How do I work towards and inspire myself and motivate myself to show up and do this difficult work without getting caught in craving. And I would say, probably we don't do it perfectly. <laughs> we just do our best with it. And we keep trying, like I keep striving in a wholesome way. And I keep observing, like as I was talking about, like the check-in and noticing, oh, what part of this striving is Chanda and what part of it is Tanha? And can I let go of the Tanha part? Can I let go of the ego part, the grasping part, and still stay engaged? Uh, it's, it's a huge, huge challenge. Yeah. yeah. One more then, Paul. I was just going to add, oh, thank you. Yeah. You mentioned a lot of things. Yeah. Which I, but, I just my comment about that is that they can like change for me. Like when I began to understand suffering, yeah. a, that there were a lot of things in my recovery, pre-Buddhist study, that I wanted to do. I wanted to be less judgmental. I wanted to be, you know, there were so many endeavors right. I had. When I began to understand the nature of them, like with mindfulness, don't know if I'll ever stop completely judging, or I'm mindful of the thought as it comes up, yeah. and I stop it, and I don't, or I, who are you call? I mean, whatever I say to myself, um, it's become a really practical way to feel good about my effort. Yeah. And, not an egoist, not in an egoist way, but more in a oh I, I, I guess I would echo what you said. It becomes more compelling the more I study it, the more I yeah, yeah. like do the allocation yeah. of it. It's it's cool stuff. Thank you. Yeah. It, it's again that kind of increasing attunement I think is really uh, that's how I view this kind of process that that I become more and more subtly attuned to the ways that I create suffering. And and just as with addiction, I became I become less and less part of that. And maybe the partner to that is becoming less and less willing to suffer. 
you know, to participate in my own suffering, you know, less less compelled to, you know, like, oh, no, I can do with that. So we should we should wrap it up. So let's just have a a moment uh, for our closing dedication. And just taking a breath, coming back into the body. <laughs> you know, I'd like to just to pra practice appreciation at the end of a evening like this, appreciating the teachings of the Buddha and those who kept those teachings alive for millennia so that we can be here today in this peninsula sticking out into a vast ocean far away from the origins of this teaching and yet able to access it. And then just to appreciate those who have kept this center alive through difficult times. And kept the Dharma alive here for us to partake. May all beings be free from suffering. Thank you. Thanks for coming. I will be back next Tuesday. If you're interested in my other teaching retreats and online stuff, uh, my website is kevingriffin.net. I did bring some books tonight. If you want a book, you can make an offering or just take it. What? what did I say? Tuesday? It starts with the T, ends with the Y. I mean, it just... Thursday. Thursday. Thank you. Thank you, everyone online. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Next time we'll let you ask questions. <laughs>